My name is uh, Tom Wilhammer. I'm a researcher working at Stockholm University. And uh, my research is largely focusing on electromicroscopy and um, specifically transmission electromicroscopy and uh, how we can use it for structural characterization of various kinds of materials. Um, yeah, so lately I've been, I've been focusing quite a bit on uh, uh, wood-related materials, materials from the forest. So in this presentation here, I am aiming at introducing this um, method, the transmission electron microscope, as well as um, some techniques for sample preparation. And um, also give you an introduction to the infrastructure we have at Stockholm University within TreeSearch. And also show you <clears throat> some examples of uh, characterizations that has been performed uh, by us or by others um, of materials uh, from the forest. Okay, okay so first, um, a few words about electron microscope. And um, I just uh, thought I'd start by showing this slide, uh, introducing dif the different types of electron microscopes that are available. You might have come across the scanning electron microscope or possibly the transmission electron microscope. So these are the two um, or two of the most commonly used electron microscopes. Um, the scanning electron microscope, as you see on the left side here, um, is a, uh, a microscope that is mainly used for uh, surface studies. We can get uh, nice images of the surfaces, um, uh, surface structures of our materials. Using this equipment, we can use, uh, we can achieve a resolution around one nanometer in our images. The SEM takes some training to use, but compared to the TEM, it's rather easy. Um, so we achieve these uh, images by or these uh, both TEM and STM. We are using electrons, so it's, um, it's a microscopy technique, but instead of light, we are using electrons, which can achieve a higher, um, uh, sorry, a shorter wavelength, and hence we can uh, obtain higher resolution than what can be achieved by light microscopy. In the scanning electron microscope, we often um, accelerate the electron by um, up to 20 kilovolt. Whereas in the transmission electron microscope, we are using significantly higher accelerating voltages, often around uh, uh, several hundred uh, kilovolts. And the difference between the SDM then and the transmission electron microscope as the name implies, is that in the transmission electron microscope, we are looking at our specimen in transmission, meaning that our electrons are, uh, are penetrating through our sample and we are obtaining signals from electrons that has been scattered in various, in, in, in various uh, manners. And we can then learn um, about our specimen. The transmission electron microscope is a bit more, um, it takes a bit more training um, to become a skilled user. And especially if one wants to use the advanced high-end techniques that is available in the transmission electron microscope. It's also significantly or rather significantly more expensive than the SEM. That's the downside, but the, 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 the the, the good side of the transmission electron microscope is that we can achieve uh, images with um, also with a lot higher resolution than what we can get in the SEM. So we can here move into the, the um, uh, atomic regime of resolutions if we are only considering uh, the performance of the microscope. As you will um, hear through this talk, uh, when it comes to specimens that comes from the forest, um, they are often uh, sensitive by the electrons that we shoot at the, at, the, at the specimen. And hence the resolution might rather be limited by the, um, 
by the stability of the sample rather than actually the physics and the optics of the microscope itself. Anyhow, in this uh, presentation, I'd like to mainly focusing on the transmission electron microscope. So as I mentioned, in, this is a, um, um, a microscope where we are accelerating electrons with, a, with an accelerating voltage of 200 or 300, uh, or let's say we can do it in a range between 60 and 300 uh, kilovolt. So we are accelerating up the electrons close to the speed of light gets a very short wavelength and we can achieve resolutions um, in, in the regime of one angstrom, which is the size of uh, the size range of, of atoms. Um, the transmission electron microscope, as we abbreviate TEM, can be operated in, in different modes. So we can either operate it in a conventional TEM mode uh, this is when we use the, the microscope more similar um, in a similar manner as to a light microscope, meaning that we use the lenses in the microscope to um, form a magnified image, which we can further magnify uh, and we can um, achieve an, an image with a high magnification and high resolution from our sample. An alternative mode is to instead use something that is called scanning transmission electron microscopy um, or STEM. And in this case, we are instead um, using the fact that we can control the position of the, of the electron beam and we can then scan it across the sample and acquire various signals as a function of the beam position. And in this way, we can build up um, a map or an image of our sample. So as I mentioned, we can obtain different types of signals in, in, the, in the TEM. So we can do imaging, but we can also do things like diffraction and spectroscopy. So on the right side here, you see an example of one of the transmission electron microscopes that we have um, at Stockholm University. So it is essentially a, a column where we um, create or extract our electrons at the top part here. We accelerate them and we let them pass through the column down here. And then we are detecting the electrons down at the bottom. And then we are inserting the, the specimen in the middle here um, and basically letting our electrons pass straight through our uh, very thin sample. Okay, so um, as it is a, a microscope, um, of course, imaging is, is a key um, technique of the, of the transmission electron microscope. But, and I mentioned that we can achieve uh, images with a very high and good resolution. But in addition to imaging, we can also do other things such as, for example, uh, diffraction. So electron diffraction is a technique where we can obtain information about the um, about uh, crystalline materials mainly um, and we can study the um, things like we can do for example we can identify crystalline phases we can um, uh, study their orientations orientation relationships or we can ev even do a quantitative analysis of the electron diffraction data and we can measure the intensities of the reflections here and we can um, for example, collect something that is called three-dimensional electron diffraction data. And using this data, uh, measuring the intensities of each of these reflections, we can then also obtain or calculate um, the position, the, uh, the average uh, positions of the atoms in this crystal structure. Another type of signal we can obtain in a transmission electron microscope is the spectroscopy signals. So we can uh, do both uh, energy dispersive X-ray uh, spectroscopy, it's called EDS or EDX. And we can also do, do uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, which is uh, called EELS. 
Um, so these uh, different spectroscopy signals uh, are then gonna uh, provide us with chemical insights into our uh, into our sample. We can learn about things like the composition, so about the elements that are present. But we can also get the information uh, if we use eels. We can also get the information, for example, about oxidation state um, uh, or um, electronic character. Uh, of the sample. So this can both be, for example, for, for metal species, if we would have that, but also for carbon, for example, we can get information about the hybridization of carbon um, in a sample. And since we do have this um, wonderful opportunity of, of controlling the position of the sample and scan uh, the position of the beam and scan the beam across the sample, we can also combine uh, this uh, spectroscopy with, with mapping. So we can build up uh, basically a map or an image where we have spectroscopy information uh, pixel by pixel, and we can then see the distribution of, of different uh, compositions, for example, um, or other spectroscopy signals uh, in our sample. One important uh, factor when doing using a transmission electron microscope is related to sample preparation. So I mentioned already that in the TEM we are shooting our electrons straight through the sample and detecting the signal below the sample or the after the sample. So this means that we have rather specific uh, um, prerequisites on, on the sample itself. So the sample needs to be very, very thin because the, the sample needs to be transparent to the electron beam. That's kind of the key challenge uh, with when we need to, uh, when, what that we need to consider when we want to prepare samples uh, for the TEM. Also, we want to use a technique that is not changing or altering the sample uh, in any way so that we are really looking at what we really have there in our sample. We want the sample uh, that we have prepared to be representative of, this, of the specimen so that we can really draw conclusions uh, from what we are observing. Also, the TEM is operated in high vacuum, so we need to put our sample into high vacuum. So we also need to make sure that our sample uh, can sustain um, uh, vacuum. I want to mention uh, one technique here that is the one that we are using mainly when it comes to preparing samples from um, samples that are based from the forest or wood sector. Um, and that is ultramicrotomy. So this technique is very uh, suitable for obtaining thin cross sections of soft specimens, uh, soft. For, for me, as being more of a wide material scientist, um, I would say that polymeric materials are in general soft to me. Um, and this is very, a very suitable uh, method for this. Um, the basic principle of this technique is that um, we are mechanically sectioning the sample using a, a, a very thin knife, a diamond or can use a glass knife, but often we use a diamond knife. And we will here obtain sections that are that are down to, let's say, 50 nanometer or even below 50 nanometer in thickness. So they are very thin. In order for a sample to be transparent to the electron beam, at least it should be um, thinner than several or let's say 100 or 200 nanometer. But it depends a lot uh, on the composition um, of the specimen that we are looking at. So often when we are uh, performing ultramicrotomy, depending on, on how the, the sample uh, formulation is, but often we end up embedding the sample into a resin first, just to obtain a um, something that we can um, clump into the ultramicrotome itself. Um, yeah, so, and then in this process, we need to make sure that we get a good uh, adhesion between the um, 
between the resin and the sample itself. It's not always necessary to embed it into a resin, but for most samples, um, it's beneficial to do that. After that, we are fastening uh, or mounting this um, resin um, embedded sample. So the sample is here up into the inside the resin and the top part here. So in this case here, we have trimmed the top part of this um, resin capsule into a very thin, uh, sorry, sorry, very small tip here. That is only if, um, yeah, I don't know, half a millimeter or, or, or less. Then um, here it is mounted on the ultra microtome. So here it sits, the small resin uh, tip. And down here we have the diamond knife. So it's, it comes in a tray. So we fill up this tray here with uh, water normally. And the diamond knife itself sits at the top part here. And the microtome itself, it works in the way that this arm here, where the sample is mounted, it's moving up and down and slowly and very um, precisely, with very precise control, this arm is forwarded towards the knife. And we will section, get very thin sections that will float out on the water here. So here you see a close up image of the tip part here where you can see this uh, diamond knife and here is the uh, the tip of this uh, gelatin capsule with the sample inside that we will um, uh, cut uh, with this diamond knife here. So we can obtain this uh, sample preparation either at uh, room temperature or we can also do it uh, using uh, liquid nitrogen cooling at the desired temperature. Um, depending on the sample we're looking at and whether it is preferential to section it um, at a specific temperature, uh, given the properties of the, the material. Okay, so these here are the three uh, transmission electromicroscopes that we have available at the Electromicroscopy Center at Stockholm University. And they are also um, a part of uh, research infrastructure. So we have two, um, let's say, conventional TEMs. <clears throat> um, I think they are now about 12, 13 years old, but they are working nicely for performing um, um, standard transmission like microscopy work, and they are uh, working very, really well. Two or three years ago, we installed a new TEM, the one you see here on the right. This is a uh, state of the art, something that is called aberration corrected TEM. So this is a very advanced TEM, which is really um, at the top level um, in, in Sweden and in the world as well. Um, and these aberration uh, correctors that we have that are available, they will essentially correct for some of the imperfections in the lenses, which will make it possible to uh, obtain um, images and data with a lot higher quality than what we can obtain uh, in the conventional TEMs, which can be beneficial for, uh, for some or many experiments. OK, so with that, I have uh, some time left. And I want to give you some examples of what we can do um, using uh, mainly TEM on uh, different wood-related specimens. So this here is mainly uh, an intro introduction just to show you some images from a scanning electron microscope um, of a um, sample of, of uh, balsa wood and that has been sectioned with a, uh, a microtome, I think. And at the top, you see the, the balsa wood. Uh, we can see the cell structure. If we magnify a bit, we can see some internal structure also in side of the, uh, the wood cell wall. And at the bottom, you see the lignified um, version of the wood. OK, so let's move from the SCM to the TEM and see what can we ob uh, obtain using the TEM. So this here is uh, some uh, examples. This is not uh, our work, but it's from the literature. Um, so this is one example of how that we can, that's possible to do staining. Staining means we apply uh, a chemical that uh, selectively bonds to a certain chemical species in the cell wall. 
In this case, we can use uh, potassium permanganate, uh, which it will um, bond mainly to the lignin part of the cell walls. And then we can, in this way, see where we get strong signal and correlate that to where, um, in which part of the cell wall that is richer in lignin. And we can really see here uh, the different parts of the cell wall um, and how they are different in terms of, of, um, of, of lignin content. This here is images from, <clears throat> from us. So this here is also a cell wall of um, balsa wood, I think. And um, in this case, we have not performed any staining. So this is a, a image of the cell wall uh, in, in its native state. Yeah, not native state really, but in its, yeah, without staining. And what we can see again is we can see the different parts of the cell wall, but we can also zoom in and we can even see uh, the direction of the um, cellulose uh, fibrils in different parts of the cell wall. So this image here to the right is essentially is a magnification of this part here, where we can see how that the uh, directionality of the cellulose fibrils is different in different parts of the of the cell wall. So this here is using TEM in. So I mentioned before that we can operate TEM in different modes. So this is images in conventional TEM mode. We can also do imaging in scanning transmission electromicroscopy mode. It's still inside of the TEM, but it's just a different um, mode of the microscope. This here is a um, transparent wood um, sample from, uh, from BERT, I think. And here we can, we can again see the different uh, parts of the cell wall. These bright um, features here. This is an artifact from the from the sectioning, uh, microtomy sectioning, kind of wrink wrinkles in the sample. If we zoom in here into different parts of the cell wall, you can see again this kind of directionality of the um, cellulose uh, fibrils in different parts of the cell wall, and we can really obtain. Um, good uh, or important uh, structural information about the sample. This here is another example. It's also a, a transparent wood sample uh, from KTH. And in this case, um, our collaborators uh, have um, impregnated the sample and, and um, created gold and silver nanoparticles inside of this uh, wood structure. And using the scanning transmission electromicroscope, we can really see where in the, this, the, this material that these um, metal part nanoparticles are located. And we can see that they are very selectively located in the, in the middle lamella and in the cell wall corners. So you can see these uh, nano-sized uh, uh, dots here. So these are, in this case, uh, silver nanoparticles that are inside uh, this uh, cell wall corner here. And the same thing is done for gold nanoparticles. So with the TM, we can really uh, locate these fine details. And in this case, we were quite lucky because these metal particles gives really strong contrasts and are quite easy to observe um, using this STEM technique. Um, Another thing we can look at is the, uh, the, the cellulose nanofibrils or cellulose nanocrystals. We can do that either by, uh, yeah, in this case, we will just disperse them on a grid. So we take the dispersion, let it dry on a grid. We can either uh, do staining, as in this case, where we can get uh, nice images uh, from, the, uh, from these uh, fibrils or nanocrystals. This is, again, from the literature. Um, one thing to note here is that these samples are going to be sensitive in the TEM, so we need to be careful not to uh, damage the crystals before we obtain our image. So this here is just to show um, how the sample is degrading in the electron beam. Um, and this here is also a different examples of different um, 
C uh, CNCs from different um, origin. I wanted to show you this as well. So this is now going from TEM images, conventional TEM images to STEM images. So these are CNCs from cotton. And in this case, we can really see the morphology of these um, cellulose nanocrystals clearly. And since we are using the STEM mode here, we don't need to do any uh, staining and we can still get a good um, contrast and good signal from these uh, uh, nanocrystals. Um, so I see that my, my, my time is, is running up here. I'm not going to dig into this so much, and I'm also not going to dig too much into this, but I, I do want to, I will anyway mention this just shortly because I, this is a lot of my research in, in, in wood related materials recently has focused on using this method that is called scanning electron diffraction. So we are using electron diffraction, um, combined with uh, scanning the beam over the sample. And using this, we can build up a, um, a kind of a map where we can study how the crystallinity varies throughout uh, the sample. Um, and this can be applied um, on, on uh, cellulose uh, samples as well, since the cellulose is, is uh, crystalline or semi-crystalline. So we can, using this method, we can really study how the, the crystalline um, structure is is developing through uh, cellulose fibers. So this here is one example. In this case, it is it is not from wood or forest. It is from uh, tunicate cellulose, which has a higher crystallinity. So we get a bit stronger uh, signal. Um, but we can obtain these kind of two-dimensional maps where every pixel contains a diffraction pattern. And by analyzing these diffraction patterns, we can then get information about how the crystallinity varies through one of these uh, CNFs. And in this case, we can really follow how this fiber is twisting around its extended direction, since these three uh, diffraction patterns here are corresponding to three different orientations where the um, direction along the fiber is maintained, but the the crystalline orientation uh, across the fiber is changing. So they are really describing a twisting uh, motion of this, of this fiber here. And we can then say that these fibers are actually crystalline through the twisting part of the fiber. Okay, I see that my time is, is running out, so I'm not gonna talk anymore, but I'm happy to take any questions.